John, please forgive me for waiting so long to answer your letter. I'll do it the best I can for you. You asked me, John, how old I was when I joined the Harmonica Rascals. I was just about 14 years old. John, when I was 14 years old, I went up for an audition to Borobedovich at the Sylvania Hotel in Philadelphia. They had just gone, had a strike, and they needed a couple of boys. That's when I went up to the Sylvania Hotel and had an audition to, to play for Mitterich. It's describe you the way you look. John, I went up to the room. I can't tell you how funny this was. It seems to be right now. I went up with a black sweater with my little, my big socks, black socks with holes in, in the knees. And I played, I auditioned for Mitterich, the great god of the harmonica. The two numbers I played for him was Drigo Serenade and Roll'em Girls Roll'em. He just happens to have liked what he heard. And he told me, I'm going to take you with me for a month. And if you work out, I'll keep you. Otherwise, you'll go home and we'll be just a best of friend. I said, fine. Well, to make a long story short, I became one of the harmonica rascals. And let me tell you, it was the happiest days of my life. My first engagement was at the Strand Theater in New York. And let me tell you, I thought I was God's one of God's chosen people. I was thrilled. It was wonderful. And we toured a few more theaters, and the first big engagement we went out to California at the Groban's Chinese Theater, which is one of the most famous theaters in the world. The first show that was in there, that was in 1928 we went there, was the Ten Commandments. The next show to follow was Douglas Fairbanks and the Gaucho. Boy, am I going back. Let me tell you, we met Douglas Fairbanks Sr., and he was a wonderful guy. And let me, you know, it was just fantastic. Met all the stars and everything. It was just, it was just like going to heaven. It was that beautiful. He was a poor little boy out of South Philadelphia already in California meeting stars and playing one of the most beautiful theaters in the world. And from there we toured around for Fancho and Marco Theaters in California. And in 1929, we made our first trip to Europe. And our first engagement was at the Palladium Theater. And let me tell you, that's the epitome of all show business. The Palladium Theater to us was like playing the Palace of New York. That's number one. You've hit the top till you play that theater. We, you, as you know, we were one of the greatest acts that ever played in the, in the theater. And let me tell you, we were cocky. Nobody could, as, was as good as us. Nobody could follow us. We used to tour, tear audience to pieces. Well, we went on that first matinee. And let me tell you, we went out there and we laid one of the biggest eggs you ever saw in your life. We couldn't uh, get an applause. We were horrible. And let, we came into a dressing room. You'd never seen eight dejected boys actually crying. Well, many of us didn't know what it was all about. We didn't know why, what happened. We stayed in the theater and told them to the evening show. And we came to the conclusion that we were just a little too fast. We had to project everything we did. We had to slow down. In other words, we were too fast for them. Well, let me tell you exactly what. We laid the big egg in the afternoon. The egg became a big ostrich egg. We tore that theater to pieces. You couldn't 
my God, they wouldn't stop applauding. They were stamping their feet. And we were just the greatest hit that ever came into the Palladium Theater. After that show, you couldn't beg, borrow, steal a seat. It just caught on like wildfire. Well, the turn, as you call them, an act, an act is called a turn over there. This guy was just so perturbed that he followed us and they, they wouldn't, wouldn't want to even see him. So he finally, after four days, he gets the audience to listen to him. He says, ladies and gentlemen, he says, I'm British. And you let American turn come over here and applaud into a British turn. Well, this is where the fun started. Some guy hit her with a big raspberry. And let me tell you, it was up in the bottom of the start of the fight. Before you knew it, it must have been bobbies all over the place trying to quell down. The next day, it was in headlines. And believe me, it was quite a thrill. You asked me if I played any other and the other theaters, we also played Jehovah and Empire, which is also one of the big theaters. It was bombed out in, during the war. But we played that. We also played Gold is Green, which is up in the other end of London. We played your provinces. We played uh, Blackpool, which is like just like our Margaret Atlantic City. It's a summer resort. Enjoyed it very, very much. We were there for about two, three weeks. From there, we went to Birmingham. Well, there was a convention in Birmingham. We couldn't get into a hotel, so what next best thing we did, we lived in a dig. And let me tell you, I don't have to tell you, it was during the winter time, and it was cold. They didn't have no central heat. And we were playing cards, and we'd warm our hands over the gas jet to keep warm. Well, there was a fireplace in the bedroom. So he said, gee whiz, let's fight the fire. So we so also took all these papers, and we put a little did we know, when we lit the fire, the flue was closed. Well, don't ask. All hell broke loose. The smoke started to come through that fireplace, and, and let me tell you, you couldn't see. And all of a sudden, this woman downstairs starts to scream, and she's screaming on before you know it, the bobbies are in there and they they huddled us off and we, before we knew we were in the station house. We were going to be arrested. Finally, they got rid of it down and everything there, and they crawled it down. That was one incident. As you know, John, we toured Europe after we played the Palladium in London. We went to Scotland, Glasgow, which was tremendous success. We also went to Italy, all through Italy. We went to Austin, Belgium, and went to Holland, and we went all over, and wherever we went, we were a big success. Then we came back to the Palladium, in London again. After we finished the Palladium, we played your Hippodrome, which was also a very, very wonderful engagement. While we were at the Hippodrome, the Duke and Duchess of York asked us if we would do a benefit for the little petite beds, that's the white beds, that's for the poor little children. And we considered, well, John, we rehearsed about two weeks. We gave up two weeks of doing this Rehearsing. We rehearsed and rehearsed. I don't know if you know Eric Coates. That's a very beautiful, beautiful man, quite a writer. And he wrote a song for us to play at the Queen's Hall. Well, the, as I'm sending you a clipping, a write-up of the engagement we did. We were quite a success. And after we did that, we were going from, uh, from the airport, we were going to Le, Le Bourget Field, we were going back to play in Paris. And who was at the airport but the Duke and Duchess of York seen us off. And we said, my God, they had presents for us. 
know, he said, gee whiz, we couldn't wait till we boarded the plane because, my God, the presence from the Duke and Duchess of York, we thought we were going to get gold and diamonds. Well, uh, I, I, our imagination just ran away with us. We said our goodbyes, we bowed and everything. We got on a plane, we, we opened up those presents. Well, you've never seen eight dejected boys in your whole life. They were little scarves. I mean, they meant well, but to us, we, we were very disappointed. We thought we were going to get, as you say, a scepter or, you know, rings with diamonds and rubies, but we got nothing. But it was quite a success, and we enjoyed doing it because it really was for a good cause. Hold. I'll be back. You asked me about Harry Heyer. May his soul rest in peace. Quite a boy. We picked him up in Washington, D.C. Funny, funny, funny boy. Good, good, good friend. And I, you asked me if he went to Europe with us on our second tour. Truthfully, John, I don't, I don't want to say yes and I don't want to say no. If I ever come up with the right answer, I'll let you know. But he was quite a boy. He left us too young. Thank you. I'll be back. I'm sending you, John, a picture of Pete and I when we were the harmonic heirs. We were together about 10 years, and there were 12, 10 good years. We were quite a knack. As many of us said, if you're good, stay good. If you're no good, get out of the business. But we were pretty good. I have to say so myself, we were a hell of an act. We were on Ed Sullivan's show about eight, nine times. Quite a feat. And I sent you a few little other pictures, which I hope you will enjoy. And as I get going on to, for God's good, and I'm here a few more years, I will send you some other paraphernalia and answer all your questions you want to be answered. John, in the near future, maybe May around, May, June, my lovely wife and myself expect to take a trip to London. And I, when we do, I will give you a call and we'll get together and I'll give you everything you want to know because I can do it better in person than I can over this little microphone here, which I'm talking into like a nothing. But I hope you appreciate the little things I am sending to you. Please forgive me again. I'm just a bad, bad boy. But as as one of the harmonica rascals, I want to say thank you for being so patient and looking forward to meeting you. You must be a hell of a guy. You say you're 69 years old. You're just a little teenager. You get to be my age. And, you know, I used to saddle Paul Revere's horse. You know, you're not mucking around with it. But I still play once in a while. I play for my grandchildren. You see, they're small, and they wouldn't know if it was good or bad, so I play for them. The grown-ups forget about. So, John, the best, you're quite a guy to tolerate me for all these years and sending all these things. And don't send me no more money because I don't need it. God has been very good to me. John, take good care and God bless. P.S. John, you asked me on your letter, the outside of your letter, about Larry Adler. As you know, Larry Adler was one of the greats, one of the finest harmonica players this world has ever known. A good, good boy and a good concert player. Larry Adler joined us in the early part of 19, oh, the early years. How he came about to come to us was Walter Winslow. I don't know if you remember him, the great, great, greatest columnist this world has ever known asked as a special favor to him for Minovitz to please take him as in as the rascal as he's a very good harmonica player. Well, Minovitz obliged, took him in, and he put him in the back. And that's where he stayed. He didn't last very long. In fact, I befriended him. Him and I became buddy-buddy. In fact, I'll tell you a little story. You may enjoy this. He had a little cigar box, and in that cigar box, they were full of quarters, which is equivalent to your 
chilly. I said, holy mackerel. Now I'm going to make myself a few good bucks. So I said, do you play gin? He said, yeah, I play gin. So we started to play gin. A long story, John. I lost $30. I'll never be bad again. Larry Adler lasted maybe about seven or eight weeks. A bit of it said to him, you know, Larry, I have to let you go. You'll never make a good harmonica player, so go home and really practice. Well, to make a long story short, you know what happened with Larry Adler. Well, we came back the second time to Europe when we played the Palladium. Larry came back, and he said, You remember, Mr. Bitterich, what you said to me when you fired me? And he said, Go home and practice. You'll never make a harmonica player. Well, what do you think about me now? Midwest said to him, you know, Larry, if I would have said to you, you were a great harmonica player then, you never would have made it. I told you were bad, so you'd go home and practice. And practice you did, and you became a beautiful harmonica soloist. That is the story of Larry Atlas.